Hello, I'm Molly and welcome to Care Experts Live, brought to you by Care Credit. I see that we already have some people coming in in the live stream. Hello, Monica and Chelsea. Hi guys, thanks for being here. I see uh, Jonathan, Lauren, Tuck in Austin, Shelly in Manhattan. Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to be here because uh, today we're talking all things pets. We are gonna be answering your veterinary and pet health questions. And a little bit later, we are going to be revealing the Care Credit Let's Get Digital Cardholder Sweepstakes Special Secret Word, which is worth 10 sweepstakes entries. So definitely stay tuned for that. But today we're in Los Angeles and we're with Dr. Jeff Werber. Dr. Werber has been a practicing veterinarian for over 35 years. He is the founder of the VCA Century Veterinary Group and the former president of the Association of Veterinary Communicators. Hi, Dr. Werber. Thank you so much for Hi, joining us. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing great. We're so happy to have you. Who's that cutie you have with this you? This is Harry, one of my five dogs and also five cats. But... Uh... So with 10 pets, we chose Harry because he's a rescue and he is so adorable. This is when uh, I first met him, this was Harry all over the place. Oh my gosh, he's so stinking cute. Oh, well, we're so glad you're here. Um, and I think it, just to start it off, um, can you just tell us and, and the people here in the live chat just a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I am one of those guys that wanted to be a vet ever since he was a pup. Um, my parents say ever since I was five. And um, I went to Berkeley undergrad, went to UC Davis for veterinary school, had a blast, and then um, started working with a, uh, my former boss when I was a technician. Uh, in fact, he hired me the day I got into vet school, not the day I got out of vet school, which is really cool. So I had no pressure going through school. Uh, then started uh, Century Veterinary Group. Um, after 30 years, sold it to VCA, and then uh, left there. And I joined another practice in West LA where I still work every day. I thought, I thought I'd start three days a week. It didn't happen. Five days a week, which, which I love. You know, for me, practicing veterinary medicine is my golf. And, um, and along the way, I got into media and just started doing um, a lot of media stuff. Actually, I think I'm one of the only vets in the country that has an Emmy Award, which I got from uh, KCBS, uh, the local Emmy, for being on their news team and doing pet spots every week. So it's cool, kind of cool. Dr. Werber, that's amazing. I mean, I was going to ask what you do when you're not being a veterinarian and helping your patients, but it sounds like you keep really. <laughs> I, I do. I do two things. In fact, last night was one of them. Tuesday nights, I play basketball with literally kids half my age, younger than my kids, and I snowboard. And I took it up at 50, and I'm actually, I, I think I'm a better snowboarder than I was a skier. So, uh, yeah, that, those, those are my fun things. And when I travel, when I can. That's amazing. I love it. And how did you know? Um, how did you know you wanted to be a veterinarian? I mean, you have all these other interests. What was the draw? It, you know, it, it's a really good question. I have no idea. And, and I, you know, I'm not alone. I, I know if I talk to probably 70 or 80% of my classmates in veterinary school, also many of them, ever since they were little kids, um, they want to be veterinarians. Um, I, I always had this magic relationship with, with pets. And um, I, for me, I, you know, when I meet kids, even my own kids, you know, they're going through life and, and even in college, some of them don't know what they wanted to do. And it's like, oh, my God, you poor thing. I knew what I wanted to do in kindergarten. So, um, yeah, it is. It, it's really great. And, you know, here I am, my 39th year of practice. And I have to tell you, uh, it's my golf. I, I love it. I, I, I go every day with joy and with a smile on my face and top it all off. I actually get paid for it. Pretty cool. Sounds like a dream job, dream life. So I love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. Now that we've gotten to know you just a little bit, um, let's get into some of our first questions. So we have had people write in from all over the country uh, questions that they want to know, uh, that they want to ask a veterinarian. So we've actually had a lot of questions about diet and exercise for dogs. So I think we're going to start there. Um, yeah. Actually, I think I see in the chat, we have somebody just asked Marlia, how many walks a week should I take my dog on? Which is perfect, because that leads us into our first question. Um, okay, so we had Brittany M. in Killing, Texas, wants to know, what is a good amount of exercise for a dog to stay healthy? You know, it really depends on, on the different dogs, um, wh where you're living, uh, what they're eating, how much they're eating. Obviously, a dog that might be eating a little too much might need more exercise. I would say minimum, minimum uh, two, preferably three walks a day. 
15, 20 minutes, uh, that's the normal daily. And then maybe once or twice a week, if you can get them out to a park, get the tennis ball, get the Frisbee, a dog park where they get to run and play with other dogs, you know, that is also great for them to do as well. But again, you want to make sure that they are staying lean, that they're on a good, healthy diet. Um, and certain breeds, especially the pushed in face breed called the brachycephalics, like Dwight, my French bulldog, be very, very careful when you're exercising because they overheat very easily and it can be very dangerous. That is very good advice. And I know sometimes it can feel like, oh, I got to go outside again. But once you get out there, that 10, 15 minutes with your dog flies by. So I love that. 10, 15 minutes, two times a day. Great. Um, One of the things I tell people is that that oftentimes obesity is is a big problem with dogs, right? And uh, it's the number one nutritional disease. And scary statistic, 75% of obese dogs and cats belong to owners who themselves could lose a few. So I always say, you know what? Getting out exercise is great. In fact, it'll be good for both of you. So <laughs> that gets the point across. It's true. They say, you know, we rescue dogs, but really they can rescue us a lot. They make you get out there and go on a walk, which is good for everybody. So that's great. And then I'm just going to follow up on that question because we did have um, Julie C. in Shakopee, Minnesota wrote in and she wanted to know, um, should daily exercise habits change for elderly dogs? You know, absolutely. As dogs age, here's the thing. As they age, they get slower. They get some muscle mass loss. They get arthritis. And the the best thing for them is to maintain muscle mass. Uh, So it's really getting them to fight through the pain. So the exercise is still essential, but it might be a little less rigorous, um, maybe not running more walks. It's it's the same as we are when we get older people, you know, the doctors want us to maintain exercise, keep the heart pumping. So it's still exercising, but it might be a modified exercise based on what they were used to when they were younger. But the key is get them out there and spend time with them. That makes sense. And I guess we can always ask our friendly neighborhood veterinarian, too, if we have any questions about our elderly dog. (laughs) Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to switch topics just a little bit because I want to cover everybody that wrote in. We had so many great questions. So Kristen D. in Auburn, Washington, she wants to know, what do you recommend looking for when purchasing a cat food? So with with cats, you know, cats are, are interesting funny because they don't often drink a lot of water. And hydration is very important given the fact that one of the number one diseases affecting cats is kidney disease. So I recommend what we call mixed feeding. Now, if you have a cat that's a great water drinker and doesn't like canned food, which is, it happens, but they're drinking a lot of water, then feed them a good quality AFCO certified, that's the American Association of American Feed Control Officials cat food. If you have any questions, talk to your veterinarian. Um, but if you're feeding a well-balanced food, they usually have taurine in it. They should because cats cannot make their own, which prevents cardiomyopathy. Uh, then it's a matter of uh, getting them the crunch. The key is they have to like the food, of course. You know, it's funny. We make the decisions, but the cats have to eat it. So let them make the decision. It's got to be tasty. They have to enjoy it. They have to have a nice shiny coat and uh, making sure it has the taurine. But I do like the idea of feeding. I have five cats. I do mixed. I do both dry and canned because I want to make sure they get enough water. That makes complete sense. And it's great to hear it from a veterinary source. So thank you for those suggestions. And then um, just to follow up on that too, Chanel B in Okalawa, Florida had asked what you feel about raw diets. So raw diets are, it's, it's an interesting, uh, great question, by the way. You know, we, we see more uh, certain diseases, Campylobacter, Salmonella in raw foods. Now, there are some raw foods out there that have gone through some processes that actually help prevent these bad bacteria. One is freeze dried, all right? And the other one is HPP, high pressure pasteurization. They also sometimes call it high pressure processing. Um, so if you have a raw diet and animals like it, and they have either one or two or both of those processes going into the manufacturing, then I am a big fan. Uh, but again, you, you, the animals like what I, I get nervous about with raw foods is that if they're not prepared properly, then we see dogs and cats that can come down with Campylobacter, Salmonella, Listeria, et cetera, uh, E. coli. So I worry about those. Okay, so sounds like do your research, maybe consult your veterinarian, Correct. check those ingredients. Okay, great. Finally, on this topic, um, we have Jeff M. from Bryson City, North Carolina, and he asks, what are some of the best vegetables to give my dog? So it's interesting. Vegetables are are usually pretty good for dogs. 
Uh, the problem is they, they're not always fully digestible. Dogs don't have cellulase. Cellulase is what helps break down a lot of those starchy vegetables. So for example, the skin of an apple, uh, the, the, a celery or some lettuce. So some of that stuff is it's not bad for them, but it might be coming out the other end exactly how it went in. So uh, I usually like feeding the, the meat of the vegetable or fruit, uh, but they can eat broccoli. Uh, they, they actually like it. Um, uh, beans, peas, carrots, they love carrots. They're very good for their eyes, a lot of vitamin A. So I think it's a, it's, it's a good thing to feed some vegetables. Uh, just understand that some of parts of those vegetables um, like the skin of a, cell, a cucumber uh, might um, not be digested completely. That's great. Thank you so much. I know I've wondered when I'm sitting there chopping vegetables, like what, what can I give my dog? What should I give my dog? So that's super helpful. Thank you so much. So I think that really helped everyone with their questions on pet diet and exercise. Obviously we could talk about this forever, but we're going to move on um, to a new topic. And I just want to also take a minute to thank everybody that's here in the live stream. I see so many people from all over. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Lily. Thank you. Who else is there? Let's see. Laura, thank you for being here. And Megan, thank you guys so much. We're so excited that you're joining us um, for this Care Experts Live. So our next topic that we are going to get to, um, we're going to talk about some pet behavior issues. Um, so, oh, and don't forget, you guys, um, pretty soon we will be revealing that special secret word. Um, it's our Care Credit Cardholder Sweepstakes Let's Get Digital special secret word. So stay tuned for that. We're almost there. Um, okay, so let's get to pet behavior issues. I do see in the chat here, I think we have a question from Daniel O. Um, and it's about dog anxiety, which is great because that is part of what we're covering next. Pet behavior issues. So Dr. Werber, let's talk about it. We have Juan C. in Charlotte, North Carolina, who asked, how do I keep my dog from getting anxiety from being left alone at home? So it's interesting. First of all, we call that separation anxiety. We, we see it a lot in dogs that are maybe coming from a shelter situation where they now finally have a loving home and they, and they just are, are so afraid they're going to be left behind again. Um, so the keys here are to, two things. And it sounds terrible. It sounds mean, but it's really not. When you are home with them, you need to look for ways that they can still play and enjoy their environment without you. That means there are some great toys and games out there that make the dogs work for their treats. So you're not giving the treats, you're not giving the reward, the game is giving the reward. So don't think every, and try to dissuade them from every sitting with them, getting up every commercial, for example, if you're watching TV, purposely get up and go to the kitchen, but the dog has to stay and give them a treat to stay. So the whole idea here is that they have to enjoy being alone, feel safe and secure. Now, when you come home during these training periods, first leave for five minutes, and then you keep extending the time. Don't go crazy. Don't say, oh my God, Gary, I missed you so much. I'm loving you. Because then what happens is they're going to start loving that. So the thing is, this is where it sounds mean. You walk in the house, you walk right by them as if they don't exist. They're going to run up to you. They're going to get all excited. They want your attention and they're not going to get it. It's almost to the point where they're going to say, boy, to heck with him or to heck with her. So, and then after a while, things settle down, then you can start giving a little treat. Um, you don't, and, and, and when you're leaving, try to get them busy doing something else. Give them a toy, give them a, uh, a, a bone or a, a chew toy with some peanut butter in it or something. Something that's going to occupy them and just carefully slip, slip out of the house. Maybe put your purse, maybe put your, your car keys and your coat outside first, and then just casually slip out of the house. Um, it's all about keeping them comfortable when you're not around. I love that, Dr. Werber, because it's, yeah, it's totally like if we don't practice separation first, how do we expect our dog to just be okay with it? Right. Make sense. Okay, great. So that's a really great answer to that question. Thank you. Um, our next question um, for pet behavior is we have Jillian O in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is wondering what is the best way to occupy a hyper dog on a rainy day? So again, if you get them used to um, ha having fun on their own, uh, it's really hard unless you have a really, you know, I tell this to people that if they live in an apartment building with one of those really long hallways as you're going through all the different apartments, 
take your ball and, and play back and forth, play a little catch inside the apartment or the, or the apartment complex. If there's some place where you can get them some exercise, there are some um, treadmills that you can teach. If you have an area, live in an area where there's a lot of rain or a lot of cold, uh, you might consider uh, one of those doggy treadmills. They do great. But really, it's, it's a matter of having fun with them when you can. And when you have a break in the rain or it's a very cold day and you have a little break, then take them out. Um, one thing about uh, small breeds and the cold, um, it's okay to put them in a coat or a sweater. Just you know, don't, don't let it impede their movement. But And other people, when you see a little dog wearing a sweater, don't laugh at them because they, their body surface area in relation to their weight is larger when they're small. And therefore, they can actually lose a, body, a lot of body heat to the cold. So it's a matter of still figuring out some creative ways to exercise them. And, uh, and also, when, if it's too cold, not just rainy, um, understand that uh, they may need a little help, a little covering when they go outside. That's great advice. I love it. And I just want to take a quick shout out to Colette in Kentucky, Amy in Houston, Mike in Texas, and Ladybug in Jacksonville. Hi, you guys. Hope you're having fun listening to all these great answers from Dr. Werber. Um, so our next question was from Michaela B. in Cynthiana, Kentucky, and she wants to know, how do you get a dog used to a newborn baby? Ah, that's a great question, and we see it a lot. And it's very similar things to when you're bringing a, a, a new dog into a household with resident dogs. So what I recommend is the following. Um, so uh, when you, first of all, there's often resentment. And we create the resentment. So when you have a dog that, that is not happy, it's because we blew it. And so what do most people do? They pay more attention to the dog when the baby's not around. Now the dog, you're teaching the dog basically, you see, life is better without that baby. It's the opposite. When the baby's out and about, you include the dog in everything with positive reward, with treats. And when the baby's asleep or napping, you kind of ignore the dog. So the dog is gonna get its rewards and it's fun with the baby around. So there's a positive reinforcement. One thing you do when a new baby's coming home, in the blanket or the pajamas, whatever you're gonna bring that new baby home in, offer it to the dog to sniff and then give a treat. And do this for several days before the baby's arrival. Then when you have the baby home wrapped up in that same blanket, that same smell, and trust me, they can smell it, you, when you, you present the dog to the baby as if this baby is the dog's baby. It's, a, it's your friend. And again, oh my God, we're home. And then you smell them, sniff, sniff the blanket, the tent, whatever it is, the pajamas. And then again, give him the same treat that you were giving him. It's also a little, it might not be a bad idea to take his favorite treat and withhold it for like a week or two before the baby's arrival and you save it for when you start letting him sniff the blanket before the baby comes and when the baby comes. So um, you want to make it a positive experience that their buds and the baby, the dog does, gets more attention in the presence of the baby. I love that positive association and everybody's a big happy family. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so along similar lines, but not uh, in human form. So Kayla W. in Hamlin, West Virginia asks, any tips for getting a dog used to a new cat addition to the family? You know, it would be very similar. I have five dogs and five cats. You know, it's interesting because my dogs are so used to seeing cats that they, they don't care. Um, it's, it's losing the cat that takes a little more time to get used to the dog because they may, may never have seen a dog before. Um, so it's, it really is very similar. You coddle the cat, um, whatever you're going to uh, use for the cat as far as the food, um, uh, let the dog kind of sniff around. And when you um, bring the cat home, have it in your arms, uh, be careful because if it's a freaky cat, <laughs> you're going to feel those claws. Um, and then and just make it fun for the dog, make it positive and go slow. Um, usually when a dog is eating and when a cat is eating, they really don't care about the other things. So maybe have them start eating in the same room, but very far apart from each other and then slowly bring their dishes together. Um, my, my dog, two of my dogs eat in the kitchen with my cats and they, they all get along great. So it can be done. It, you probably have a more difficult time with the cat getting used to a dog than the dog getting used to a cat. That's great. That's so much good, helpful info. So thank you. Um, and now I, Susan B in Idaho Falls has a kind of different question. We're just going off to a different direction. But in Idaho Falls, uh, she is wondering, what does it mean if a dog keeps licking their paws? Okay, so there are a few things that it could be. Um, when dogs lick their paws, it could be either an allergy, something that they are getting irritated on on their walks. Uh, it could be, interestingly, food allergy. One of the most common 
um, signs of food allergy are face rubbing, ear infections or ear rubbing, and licking their paws. But usually when they do that, they lick with a, enough verga that they actually can cause some sores, scabs, what we call erythema, which is redness to the feet. Um, and understand also that food allergy is a bit overrated. It's really not as common as people think. Um, but also another thing, when, when do dogs lick their paws? But they're causing no problem. You look at the feet, there's no saliva staining, there's no sores, there's no irritation, there's no infection. It could be a form of anxiety, just like a person who sucks their thumb or bites their nails. It just appeases them and they sit there and they just lick and lick and you can distract them very easily. That's when you say, ah, cut it out and give them their true, their true toy, their bone. And another thing, sometimes if they use their front feet to hold a bone, some of whatever it is in that bone, the smell rubs off on their feet and then they continually want to lick the feet even when they're not holding the bone. So if it's persistent, you need to see your vet, try to rule out some of the medical problems. Um, and then if it's that, uh, after that, you would think probably more behavioral. Thank you, Dr. Werber. Okay, so now we are gonna take a short break because we are gonna reveal the Care Credit Let's Get Digital Cardholder Sweepstakes special secret word. The secret word is health. Through October 31st, 2022, you can earn entries for your chance to win $2,000 in the Let's Get Digital Care Credit Cardholder Sweepstakes. Enter the secret word health in the Sweepstakes Hub to earn a special 10 entries now. Head over to the Sweepstakes Hub by simply visiting carecredit.com slash let's get digital. No purchase necessary. A purchase will not increase your chances of winning. Open to legal residents of the 50 U.S. and U.S. territories, including D.C., 18 and over, who have a care credit credit card as of 9-6-2022. Void where prohibited. Promotion starts 9-7-2022 and ends 10-31-2022. Sweepstakes prizes are awarded in the form of a check for official rules, including odds, free method of entry, and prize description. Visit carecredit.com slash let's get digital. Sponsor is Synchrony Bank, 170 Election Road, Draper, Utah. 84020. Okay, so let's get back to some shout outs here. We have some more people here. I see Heather in Hollywood. Thank you so much for being here. We also have Stacy T, Paula J, Michael B. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're so excited to get some, uh, some time with Dr. Werber and some veterinary expertise. So um, we are going to go back to some more questions, Dr. Werber, if you're ready. So uh, ready. let's see, Erica E. and Megan L. are in the chat asking about bathing, brushing their dogs. So perfect. We'll go to the next topic, pet cleaning. Uh, we had Samantha P. in Winsboro, South Carolina, who wanted to know how frequently should you give your dog a bath so that their skin does not dry out? So again, this all depends on, on the dog and the dog's skin condition and if the dog is having skin problems. Typically for dogs, grooming somewhat regularly, several times a week, they love to be brushed, combed, whatever. You wanna make sure they don't get matted. As far as bathing, look, my, some of my dogs I bathe once a month. Uh, some people like their, 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 have like these apartment dwelling dogs, they wanna keep them really nice and clean all the time. They may wanna be uh, bathed once a week, which is okay. More than that, I think it depends on your veterinarian's advice and the skin condition. We have many dogs that have skin problems, skin infections, pyoderma, seborrhea, and they need baths a couple of times a week. So uh, that, then, of course, you do it a couple of times a week. Uh, the keys really are you know, based on the, the dog, the type of shampoo you're using, the recommendation of your veterinarian, and, um, uh, and, and of course, necessity. Uh, if the dog's got, you know, got out in the mud, and you're gonna have them in your house and you wanna give them a bath first, obviously give them a bath to clean out. So uh, a good, interestingly, this is funny. If you don't have a pet shampoo, all right, something that was prescribed by your veterinarian or something you can buy at, a, at a, a good pet store, you have something in the house probably all the time that actually makes a good pet shampoo. And that is either like a Dawn or Pomala dishwashing soap. That's right, dishwashing soap works great on dogs. The pH of the soap is more likely to be um, accepted by the dog's skin. They don't dry out. So you always have something ready in case you need to give your dog an emergency bath. Yeah, that's right. And they use that to clean up oil spill animals too, right? So it is definitely animal safe and yeah, yeah totally, totally great to use. Awesome. Okay, so Hope S in Ada, Michigan wants to know how often should you give your cat a bath? 
<laughs> as often as the cat will let you, which is not very often. Um, I would say make sure the first thing, it depends how much you want to preserve the skin on your forearms. Uh, if you are worried about that, you've got to be very careful. I always recommend in seriousness, clip their toenails first before you try anything. Most cats do not like to be bathed. Now, if you start as a kitten, then that's okay. One of my cats drinks its water by sticking its entire head under a running faucet. As the water drips down their face, they, he licks the water off of his face. Um, so that's interesting. That's not normal. Um, but make sure you have a good hold on your cat, scruffing the cat, don't let go. And again, don't use a, a spray or anything that's going to freak the cat out. Uh, and if you can start when they're young, then that's the way to get them used to it. Uh, it is not easy, but it can be done. And actually some cats don't mind. If you have one of those cats, then again, but cat, remember, cats are fastidious. They like to keep themselves clean. So they need, they need baths typically less often. But for long haired cats, like the Himalayans and the Maine Coons, you have to be very careful because they will mat easily if they're not brushed or combed regularly. That's sometimes more important than bathing. That's right, because those mats can get ugly oh, and poor on the skin. So you really got to make sure you're on top of your brushing with those long haired cats. Yeah. Um, okay, so next question we have Melinda B in Midway, Alabama, who asks, how often should a dog get its teeth cleaned? So recommendations vary here. Um, the best way to keep for home care to avoid professional dental care uh, is to brush your pet's teeth ideally every day, at least every other day. Uh, it is still the best way to keep the teeth clean. Uh, you want to get rid of plaque. Plaque is left over after a meal. It turns into tartar. You work on the bacteria in the mouth and saliva. And ultimately, once it reforms tartar or calculus, you need professional cleaning. Um, so I recommend starting around, around age of three, 75% of dogs and cats already have some sort of periodontal or dental disease. So that's usually the first dentistry. And then from there, it varies. Uh, as they get older, at least, I mean, certainly once a year, and small breeds, I notice, actually develop more plaque. And they're also the ones that lose their teeth more frequently. So you might have to go in every six months. Again, it is very individualized. Check with your veterinarian, have your teeth, your pet's teeth checked regularly, and you determine how often based on that. One thing I will tell you, um, the most veterinary specialists, veterinary dental specialists, uh, do recommend professional dental cleaning. The anesthesia-free dentals work okay on getting the plaque off the surface of the tooth that is visible, but they do not do a good job getting underneath the gums and preventing bone disease and bone resorption. So um, again, check with your vet. Yeah, I think sometimes people don't realize how much of the dog's health their teeth can affect. Oh, absolutely. When it just, just as an FYI, in dogs that, that ultimately succumb to glomerulonephritis, which is a kidney filtration system infection, or endocarditis, an infection of the heart valves, the bacteria cultured from these diseases originated in the mouth. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's wow. cool. You gotta clean those teeth. <laughs> right. That's why okay. we want teeth brush. And exactly. Teeth brush Every bacteria. day. Awesome. Okay, so uh, this one is from Kristen L. in Holliston, Massachusetts. She's wondering how often should I be cutting my dog's nails? Nail trimming, uh, I, I would say, as often as necessary. Um, dogs that are foo-foo dogs that are sitting in, in, you know, in high-rise apartments and rarely feet touch the ground will need their nails trimmed more often. Uh, dogs that are like my big Labrador, who's running on the streets and having fun, he hardly ever needs his nails done except for the new claws because they never touch the ground. Um, but I will tell you this, that it is very important. Start trimming nails, handling feet, touching feet when they're young. Let them get used to the process. Always do this, rub, play with the feet, and then give them a treat. Make it a positive experience. When you are trimming nails for the first time, better to trim less than more and do it more often. Why? Because when you are clipping nails, if you hit that quick, which is the nerve and blood supply, that's when you get these animals that say, uh-uh, you're not coming near me and literally resist and fight and go nuts if you come near them with a, a toenail clipper. So get an appropriate toenail clipper, trim a little bit first. You can also get one of those, um, the, 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 the automatic, the electric nail trimmers that basically are like an emery board, all right? And it's, it's like a drill. And it's, it's just, as it rotates, 
uh, it can it's a, it, it can basically trim the nails and also take away the edges. So it's called a Dremel. And if you want to talk to your veterinarian about a Dremel type of nail trimmer, that works well too. But with those, sometimes the noise freaks them out. So it really varies. I have many patients to come in and the reason they come in is just for us to trim the nails because they have failed. Yes, and each dog's different. I know for three of my dogs, I use a Dremel and for two, I just clip because they don't right. like the Dremel. So you have to figure out your dog's choice. Correct. <laughs> Um, great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Werber. So before we move on to the next topic, I just want to check in with our live streaming folks. Thank you guys. Roxanne in LA, Miguel in Connecticut. Hello, DJ in Orlando, Mary in South Korea. Wow. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, we're so happy to have you and thanks for joining us for Care Experts Live. So if you did miss the special secret word, we will be uh, revealing the word again after our next set of questions, but we're going to wrap it up with Dr. Werber um, on some general pet health questions. Uh, so our first question, um, we have a good one from Haley S. in Wichita, Kansas. She asks, what are the top three things you recommend pet owners do to keep their dog the healthiest? Well, I think the top three things would be um, nutrition, really good nutrition, exercise, and regular veterinary visits. Because a lot of diseases, especially with cats, um, that um, uh, are hidden because dogs don't complain. You know, we see things and it bothers us more than it bothers them or it does bother them, but they don't have that same reason to complain. So the best way, preventive care is way better than trying to treat a disease once it's already started. So I always recommend, and veterinarians differ as about when the first time they should come in for full physicals. I'm talking just routine physicals with blood and urine and maybe x-rays. Um, I, for me, it's small breeds of dogs and, and cats is eight years of age, um, large breeds, seven years of age. Um, some, some veterinarians like to start at six. Now, prior to a procedure, like a dental procedure or a surgery, of course, your bloods and urine might be um, uh, taken and tested before anesthesia. But I'm talking routine care. So those three things, good nutrition, also modifying the nutrition as our dogs or cats age, and Plenty of exercise, again, of modifying that when they age as well, and preventive veterinary care. I love it. Yes, preventative is key. That's awesome. Thank you, Dr. Werber. Uh, so we had Charles H. in Red Key, Indiana, wants to know, how long should you wait to get something uh, on your pet looked at if it's not hurting them? So I, th these are great questions, by the way. And um, so, yes, if you, have, if you see something on your pet that's not bothering, um, you should still probably have it looked at if it's growing. Now, if it looks like something you've seen before, like a wart or a little fatty tumor, and it, it feels like it, and you want to keep an eye on it, that's okay. But if it's something new that you've never seen before, it's always best to have it checked by your veterinarian. Your veterinarian may just look at it and say, oh, don't worry about it. It's nothing to worry about. Or it might say, you know what, let's do what's called a cytology. Let's stick a little needle into it, take a look at the cells and see, is this something to worry about? And then also what I often do is when we're going to anesthetize a dog for a reason like a dentistry or a, some sort of surgery, if there are these little lumps and bumps and things that have concerned you, that might be a good time to remove them. And that way it just takes away the worry. Um, but uh, it's, it's always good to have things checked, especially if you've never seen it before, even if it doesn't seem to be bothering the dog. That's right. And some dogs hide stuff really well, you know, they don't show pain all the time. Right. That and that's sense. also true with, with, um, with like bone lesions and arthritis, limping. Uh, you see a limp, if you, don't, you may feel the leg, you don't feel anything, but you know, something could be going on inside. It could be a soft tissue injury. It could be early arthritis. So it does help to get these things checked out. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, great. So uh, we have Michael M. in El Paso, Texas, who wants to know, when is the best time to neuter your pet? That's, uh, this is something new. And this is, again, my opinion. We used to say six months. Um, less than that, I have concerns. And I'll tell you why. A lot of small breeds, for example, um, will have what we call retained deciduous teeth. Those are baby teeth that don't fall out properly when the adult tooth erupts. So what happens is we have to pull those baby teeth, obviously requires anesthesia. If you neuter or spay a dog at four months, 
which I guess you can do, but then you worry about, you might have to knock them out again at six or seven months to pull those baby teeth. That's silly. So minimum for me, minimum six months. Now, there's a lot of new data recently where there are some other ill effects to this early neutering in Spain. Uh, in large breeds, for example, uh, they found that the, the incidence of bone cancer in older large breeds was greater if they were pre puberty spayed or neutered. So my recommendation now is for small breed, and again, check with your veterinarian. My recommendation for small breeds, six months is okay once the teeth are in. Uh, if you have a mix, and there are a lot of mixes out there, mini doodles, many different types of mini doodles. Remember, one of those breeds was a large breed. So I treat them as a large breed because genetically they have large breed in them. So I will say at least a year of age. And for females, where we used to want to spay them prior to the first heat, now we say let them have one heat and then get them at around 11 to 13 months, which is before their second heat, which is usually at 14 months of age. Um, so you want to check with your vet. And there's one breed out there, golden retrievers, that just some data coming out that, that says maybe you want to wait longer. Or some experts say, and I don't know if I agree, that their risk of certain cancers are greater when they're spayed or neutered. And therefore, they will never spay or neuter a golden retriever. Um, again, there's some new data coming out. You want to stay current. Check with your vet. Check with the data. Go online. Do some homework. But I would say for the short answer, six months for small breeds and at least um, a year or more after one heat for big breeds. And some even let the small breeds now have one heat. That's what I practice. This is great. We are getting fresh off the presses, veterinary research, <laughs> some tips here that's hot off the presses. I love it. Um, so great. So finally, doctor, uh, many care credit card holders are always looking for the best quality health for their animals, of course. Um, I see that Joni R uh, had the same question actually as our last submission question, which is from Brianna A in Northport, Florida, who asks, what are some key things to look for when choosing a veterinarian? You know, I, I would say you have, vet, being a, a good veterinarian uh, is a lot about personality, caring. Is my tagline when I lecture is, the truth is clients really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So, you know, I, I'll, I'll see a pet and they're literally, I walk in a room, they're the pets on my, in my face, giving me major, major licks, right? Hugging me and I, I reciprocate. I, I love, I, I just, the, the, the interaction is great. And so many clients will tell me, new clients, oh, so-and-so told me you were going to do that. What does that tell you? They're not telling you how great a spay I, do, I did or how beautiful my, my skin workup was, right? Or how great the, my, my splenectomy was. They're talking about how available I am, how much I care. I get back to them. That's what people are judging veterinarians on. Of course, you have to be competent. Hoping if you went to a, a veterinary school and graduated and passed all your boards, you have that degree of competency, but there's so much more to becoming a good veterinarian. And um, I think that's really what it boils down to is finding a vet that you, that available right now, so many veterinarians are not available. It just, it's amazing to me how many veterinarians are, they're so backed up because of COVID and who knows what, and not seeing patients in exam rooms with the client that they're saying, no, no, we can't accept any new clients or, oh, I can see you, but it'll be two weeks. That's, that's not acceptable. For me, it's, you need to come in, your dog's been vomiting for three days. I will get you in. It, it, it might be a wait, I might be patient, but I will not go home until I see your pet. So there, it, it's, it's a different philosophy. I'm a hundred percent dinosaur when it comes to my philosophy and I get it, but I, that's what I would look for. Someone who truly is gonna help you with your pet when you need the help, not when they have time. That absolutely makes sense. And we love your heart and your passion. Thank you so much, Dr. Werber, for answering all of our questions. We really, really, really appreciate it. And thanks to your fuzzy one for sitting there so nicely the whole time. He's been so good. He is so cute. This is why I brought him home. I couldn't get enough of him. So. I got to show you my little guy. This is Urkel. Urkel, I love that name. That's so they great. Can hide each other. Huh, buddy? <laughs> you got to love the loved ones, you know? They oh, just want some pets and some love. Yeah. <laughs> So awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Werber. We're so grateful again to you for answering all of these questions. Um, let's see, we still have, let's, Jeanette in uh, Arkansas, Deb in Minnesota, Sue in Savannah. Um, who else do we have? Jose in Sacramento. 
Debbie in Michigan. So all those people are here to listen to your amazing advice. Thank you so, so, so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, I do my AMA, my Instagrams and my AMAs on Sunday mornings. You can have people come on and ask away. I love helping people with their pets. Uh, we just, we love your passion and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so thanks everybody for watching. Um, we have a, a special secret word. So we want to make sure that in case you missed it earlier, that we get to show you that word. So the care credit, let's get digital sweepstakes special secret word is health. Through October 31st, 2022, you can earn entries for your chance to win $2,000 in the Let's Get Digital Care Credit Cardholder Sweepstakes. Enter the secret no, word HELTH, H-E-A-L-T-H, in the Sweepstakes Hub to earn a special 10 entries now. Head over to the Sweepstakes Hub by simply visiting carecredit.com slash let's get digital. No purchase necessary. A purchase will not increase your chances of winning. It's open to legal residents of the 50 US and US territories, including DC, 18 and over, who have a care credit credit card as of 9-6-2022. Void where prohibited. Promotion starts 9-7-2022 and ends 10-31-2022. Sweepstakes prizes are awarded in the form of a check. For official rules, including odds, free method of entry, and prize descriptions, visit carecredit.com slash let's get digital. The sponsor is Synchrony Bank, 170 Election Road, Draper, Utah, 84020. So thank you everyone for watching Care Experts Live. Thank you for submitting all your questions from all over the country. Uh, all of our featured care experts recommend and accept the care credit credit card, which is accepted at hundreds of thousands of provider locations nationwide. For more information, just visit carecredit.com. Thank you guys so much. We've had so much fun with these live episodes. Uh, so stay tuned. We're going to have more in 2023. So please stay with us and be sure to subscribe to the care experts podcast. Um, it's at any listening platform. So just pick your favorite listening platform to subscribe and also subscribe to our care credit YouTube channel for new episodes every Wednesday. So I still see we have some great people in the chat. Final shout out to Wanda. Erica, Sarah, thank you guys so much for being here. We'll see you next time. Have a great day and thanks for joining us.